podcast. I had to take a break last week because it was my birthday and that's more important than soccer. But we've had a wonderful weekend in European football. And to break that down, I'm here with Jess at Fanatica. And so Jess, tell us a bit about yourself. How did you start supporting Real Betis? Hi. Um, okay, well, I started getting back into football uh, after a long uh, time at college, around 2017. Uh, so back then, um, you know, and this Guardado joined Betis um, from PSV. And then back then, uh, so Guardado is, you know, the captain of the Mexico national team. And I'm a big fan of CONCACAF and Mexico is the biggest one there. So it was natural to start following Betis in 2017. Um, but, you know, back then I was also keeping track of a lot of other teams. So um, it, like I wasn't fully uh, sold to them yet. Although I do remember um, around the winter, um, Betis do this um, like toy drive where they like throw toys into the pitch of their stadium. Oh yeah, I remember. And I thought that, yeah. yeah, so that was really cool. And I was like, oh, okay, this team is like, okay, the teams, the fans are really into it. Um, so that's when I started like trying to see. And then what really sold me was, um, finally catching one of the games before kickoff and hearing um, the anthem uh, of Betis. Uh, and that was like, wow, like this is like amazing atmosphere. Um, yeah, basically since 2018, I've been uh, pretty much watching like all the Betis games I can. Um, that Europa League run in 2018, 2019 um, and up until now. Oh, that sounds that sounds really heartwarming. And um, the Seville Derby must mean a lot to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and that happened this weekend. Like I'm sure you haven't seen much better su success in this derby. And this one wasn't wasn't any different. It was a very cagey game. A red card happened. Marcos Acuna scores at the lasso. Like how? Like first of all, let's talk about the red card. Like was that deserved early on in the game? Oh, okay. Well, when I was watching it, you know, it's like very emotional. Um, my thoughts was like, okay, it's Mateo Laos and he's, um, you know, trying to be the center of attention because when, when Guido made that, made that foul, it's like, Lajos already had the red card out. Like he didn't even take twice. Um, so yeah, at that time I was like, it, just, that was ruined the game again. <laughs> Um, but, you know, on second, uh, thinking about it, analyzing it, it's like, okay, Guido actually was, um, he was on the nice edge. He had been committing a lot of fouls. It was, it was a long time coming. And I guess if I had been another ref, maybe they wouldn't have given um, the second yellow. But in hindsight, you know, Guido should, should have just let Rafa Mir go. But and That's it, that, and that conditioned the whole game. Yeah, it is Rafa Mir, though. Like, there was no point in making that tackle. He was not going to score that game. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't stop scoring chances. He, he was never going to score. <laughs> and this week was... Before this week, Betis had been performing really well, and this was a big week for them. They played Atletico, they played Leverkusen, they played Sevilla, and they lost all the games. And what does that tell you about this Betis team going forward? Like, what can they achieve? Going forward, they were right there. Then Champions League place, uh, close to the Champions League places at the moment. But do you think this week has shown that maybe this is temporary? What is? I mean, it is temporary. Like, I don't think they could have. So before this week of um, the three losses, Betis has gone like almost an entire calendar year with um, like two or three losses. And that for sure was temporary. Like that's almost the best in, in the entirety of Europe. Um, but I do think that it really depends on what the other teams do. Um, for example, like Barca is still 
really far down in the table, you'd know, you, you would think that they're gonna go back in top four. Um, so I think right now, this round of games is like, like well, it's all against Champions League quality teams. Um, so they were gonna be tough. If you look at it that way, it's like, okay, it was always in the cards that they could lose all three. Um, so we'll see, uh, I guess, you know, the season's long. Um, and as long as Betis can beat like the teams they are supposed to beat, I think that they will get Europe again. Uh, Champions League is still, still a dream. Yeah, it's a dream, eh? To get to the Champions League. And Pellegrini's done an amazing job there, but mm-hmm. you can find a way to beat the top teams. And especially in this derby, like Betis haven't won it in the last, I think, two, three seasons. Like, what's what what needs to change for them to start winning this derby? Because they have been competitive, unlike in the past, but they haven't beaten Sevilla in two, three years. Yeah, so it's been since 2018 that they haven't won a derby. Um, so that's th- a whole three years without the derby win. Um, I think this this game probably came at a bad time. Um, so, you know, the run of three three games, the Europa League uh, away in Germany and then coming um, back on two days rest, while Sevilla had uh, four days rest. Um, so it was always going to be difficult. Um, and because of that, I think that condition, um, the Gaini not to really go for it. Uh, I think it was it started a little bit too conservative, like playing, sort of playing not to lose. And I think they need to, like extent they need to go all out. Um, you know, the the last, well, in 2018, the first derby I saw was um, the 5-3. Oh yeah, that was and, great. Mm-hmm. And that was pretty much like, that is going all out, you know, like, um, and I think that's what they need to do again. Um, especially, you know, as you said, it's been a long time. Um, and this Betty side um, is definitely, their, their forte is the attack. So hopefully um, the schedule will be better um, in, in the spring. Um, yeah, I hope. And we'll see a better game. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so as well. But like right now, it's Betis are still close to Atletico. Barcelona, as we mentioned, they're far away from them. And they had a, it was a wonderful game on Saturday. Not wonderful for Barcelona fans. Brainstorming start, amazing goals in the first half. But Celta Vigo, what a comeback. And mm. yeah, it's like what led to that Barca collapse? Like, because. I was watching this game and at 3 0, I was just like, okay, it's over. So I was doing something else, but watching it in the background. But then as the goals kept on, as Celta got the first goal, I was like, there's a comeback on the cards. And Celta created lots of chances. There was the penalty appeal and Iago Aspas. He was going through a rough time. He hadn't done much. And wow, like, how did you see this game? It's. Yeah, it's very surprising um, because it's, it's, it's exactly as you said, you know, that Saturday was when they formally said that, um, you know, Xavi's going to be the new manager. Um, so everyone was very excited. Um, and the first half, Barca went all out. Um, I really don't want to say that it's like, you know, a lack of concentration, um, um, you know, their injury crisis is pretty severe. Fatih went out again. Yeah. So maybe it's like, okay, the kids um, don't have that experience to see the game out. Um, yeah, I, I agree with that. I agree with that. But I also think maybe the lack of, like, lack of concentration maybe played a part because even it was a similar theme, like Carling Schlotti and Kotoas said after the Ramit Jabari game, which we'll get to, that, and he said the words, you have to be pessimistic. And I don't think Barca were, I don't think, I don't think they went for it in the second half in a way that they controlled the game because they just allowed it to happen. It was like they weren't pessimistic enough about going for the fourth goal when, especially when Celta scored the first one, like making it 4-1. And that's something you would have seen from Barca in the past. 
But on Shaq, mm -hmm. how do you think he's going to change the mentality of this team? Because it's people are comparing it to Pep Guardiola. I don't think it's that yet because the team is at a much lower level than when Pep took over. But like, does he have this? Do you think someone like him with his ideas can change the situation at Barcelona? It's difficult um, because so Xavi has been in Qatar for like three years. Um, so he's had like, you know, um, top team uh, experience now. Guardiola had only been on the B team back then. So he was like fully in, um, within the Barca system. But Xavi, um, you know, he has a very, very difficult situation. You know, back then, uh, you know, Messi was still coming out. Um, of course, he had Xavi and Iniesta, so it's like very, he had all the cards he needed to succeed, but Xavi right now, um, it's like he has a, a full 11 of injured players. Um, Messi gone, he has to do a whole rebuild. It's it's very difficult. Um, he basically, he's got, he, I don't know if his status as a Barca legend is going to, um, is, is going to ha like have as much effect. Um, he's really gonna have to uh, dig deep and sort of, you know, just, just try to find uh, those, uh, try to develop all the players, you know, Fati, Gavi, all of the players um, that could, could be the next stars and sort of develop them. And I don't know if he had that experience in Qatar. Sure. Um, yeah, and it seems like it's gonna be a long-term job for him, right? Yeah. Um, and thoughts again, on he's a legend. Sorry, I, yeah, again, he's a legend. So he has a long leash um, to, to, to say, I guess, in short. So we'll see. Sure, but Coleman was a legend too. and. Um, things turn out pretty poorly for him. But like, I get your point that Xavi, there's a romanticism with Barcelona fans about Xavi. Like he's the next like generation from Cruyff to Pep Guardiola and now it's Xavi. And there's this belief that Barca will go back to the way they were prior to Luis Enrique and start playing football that they were, but it, it is difficult, but the players are there for that. Like you can develop that, but at the same time, you have younger players who don't have that experience yet. And maybe that's what played a role in this defeat. But another player who is central to this defeat is Marc-Andre Testergen. He's been getting a lot of criticism for that. How much of that, of this defeat and of Barcelona's season does Testergen play a part in? I think it would be harsh to pin this on him. Um, because, you know, there's only so much a, a keeper can do. But, you know, for a club like Barca and Ter Stegen, who, is, who wanted to dethrone Neuer at the, the German national team, when the standards are that high, it is disappointing to see him um, have, I guess, at best, average performances. Yeah. Um, it seems like every shot it faces now is going to be a goal, which <laughs> should happen. Yeah. yeah. But transitioning away from Barca, another goalkeeper who's going through a similar rough patch is Jan Oblak. And it's mental when you think of it that Atletico Madrid will be leading 1-3 going into X, going into stoppage time and they're equalized on. And so, sometimes you look at Atletico games and you see Oblak and you're like, the old Oblak would have saved a lot of these shots, but he's going through a rough patch as well. And Atleti, their defense is going through a terrible patch. Like they're conceding more goals than games, which is unusual for the Simeone era. And what's led to this change? Is this is it a change of system? Is it um, personnel is not good, or is it another reason that we're not discussing? Well, perhaps it is like. Um... Well, the personnel is just even better. It should be better than last year, right? Um, yeah. They only lost Saul um, and Terreira. 
Um, so it's, and they got, um, you know, Griezmann back um, and a couple other players. So Atleti should be doing better. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, it's like all that, that every time you hear Cholismo, it's, uh, you know, it's about um, grinding through, it's about, you know, being the, the, um, the team that nobody thinks will win. Um, maybe at, at I mean, this is just like as you know, as a fan's perspective. Maybe at the are not used to being the contender. Yeah. Um, so I feel like you know, in the beginning of the season, everyone was saying, "Okay, Messi has gone from Barca. Uh, Madrid, Sidan uh, has gone from Madrid. So this is Atleti season to um, to take the title again." Um, and I don't think, yeah, I don't, I don't think. Cholo has been able to integrate Griezmann well into the team again. Um, o Black, for some reason, is uh, is not being the, the octopus he usually is. Um, so when you have like uh, these pillars that aren't working, um, and as well as the hemorrhaging of goals, I think um, that sort of mentality um, creeps in of not being able to again close close the game out. So. Like, I don't know. I, I guess to be fair to them, they were playing the Valencia side who have an amazing spirit and the style. And this is the second time Valencia have done this. They did this to Mallorca, but Mallorca had 10 men and they were leading 2-0 at, by the time it got to 90 minute and by the end of the game, it was 2-2. And this was similar. It's like when Hugo Duro scored in the 91st minute, I, was, I, I had a feeling Valencia would come back. I just had that feeling. Because they, they just had that that I, I don't know what it is. It's that specialness about Mestaya this season, even though it's not been full. But in in the tough moments, they just have that belief, and that's that's what it shows, right? Mm -hmm. And it's crazy. It's the, yeah, go on. So, oh yeah, I was just gonna say that you know it's the third game that Valencia has come in, in the dying minutes. They also did it against Athletic Club. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's crazy they don't show that spirit away away from home because against when they played against Betis away from home, they looked like a team that was going to struggle for relegation or something. But at home, they even when they don't play well, even when things go against them, they just have that spirit, and maybe that's what Jose Bordalas has brought into the team. Yeah, for sure. Um... Borda, I, I don't know if it's a term to say Bordalismo. Um, Yo, I'm right in the Borda letter right now. I really like it. <laughs> but moving on to Real Madrid, they played against Raya Vallecano. I love Raya Vallecano and the way they played, but in this game, they sort of disappointed me. Madrid were brilliant in the first 60, 70 minutes. They created lots of chances. There should have been three or four goals up, but then Falcao, the legend, comes on and he scores. It's unfortunate that he gets injured because, like, those last minutes, they were so nervy for Real Madrid. <laughs> yeah, Rayo has been great. Um, you know, they came through the playoffs, uh, so I didn't expect them to be this good, if I'm being honest. Um, but Falcao has basically uh, aged like wine. Like, he's doing so well. Uh, unfortunately, he got injured. He's going to be out for, like, four weeks, so... Yeah. It's a real shame. Um, also, you know, Colombia, he was going to be the World Cup qualifiers. Excited for that. Um, that's not going to happen anymore. But yeah, um, I think Rayo has, okay, before a couple, last week uh, against Celta, they had won all of their home games. Yeah. So it's sort of similar to what you mentioned about Valencia. It's like, you know, Alba Yecas. Um, Rayo just have that extra um, spirit to see the games out and I guess away from home um, they can show that I mean the Betis Rayo game was also uh, <laughs> it was also uh, yeah it was substitute you know. that game right it was like mm -hmm. and then they, they nearly came back they nearly came back in that game as well yeah, like with Real Madrid, do you think there was an element of complacency here? Because they they seem to have the game wrapped up until up until that Falcao moment, and at the end, Rayo should have, I believe, gotten a penalty in that last play. But 
do you do you feel maybe this Real Madrid team that although they have a huge gap over or not a huge, huge gap over Barcelona, a somewhat big gap over Atleti, do you think that complacency might mean that despite the, it being four points over Atleti and ten points over Barca, like this isn't fully fully over, not discounting Rasa Stan and Sevilla, obviously. Yeah, Real Madrid is definitely not at their peak. They have a lot of um, a lot of holes to attack. I mean, they're still playing um, Casemiro, Modric. Uh, you know, Vinicius is, is you know the revelation of the season so far. Yeah, he's um, so it's like a, I don't want to say like a. So this is. Um, you know, when their the young players need to be flourishing. Um, and perhaps the core of their team has gotten a little bit complacent. Um, but they do have a lot of hunger. They have a lot of new players, uh, you know, Alaba willing, and again, Vinicius willing to prove themselves. So, and can't ever discount Benzema. So it, it's, it's far from over. Um, I don't know. I don't know if it's a dressing room issue, if Ancelotti um, has, you know, the faith yeah. or has captivated the players as much as Zidane had. Um, because defensively, they don't seem as good as last season. It seems like if a team has a structured enough attack, they can counterattack easily. Courtois is facing more shots than he did, more shots on target, more shots on, on his goal. He's having to make a lot more saves than he did last season. And against a better team, because Real Madrid, they haven't really faced the top, top teams at the Bernabeu, apart from Villarreal. But you just feel if they face, let's say, a Sevilla or Real Sociedad or, or an Atleti, they might get beaten in the way that they haven't been this season. I mean, that would be a feat to see. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think Madrid are, well, uh, let's not discount that they did last at the Bernabeu against Sheriff. Um, so it's like, they, they are definitely still fallible. They have a lot to improve. Um, I guess fortunately for them, um, you know, Atleti is going through a rough patch. Farsa is in uh, relative chaos. So we'll see. Um, I'm not, do you know uh, when they will play La Real or Sevilla? Yeah, so they're going to play Sevilla, I believe, close to November and La Real just after the international break. But on La Real, which is a nice transition, they won against Osasuna. Marino scored the goal. Yanis like, got a penalty, awful challenge by Unai Garcia. But how far do you think they'll go? Do you think they can stay the pace, like compete for the title this year? Or are they just like pretending like last year? <laughs> Uh, a lot remains to be seen. I mean, it's exactly how you said, like last year, you know, Real was also a uh, top for a couple um, of match weeks. And then in the spring, it all came um, back to reality. Um, but I think the difference this time, you know, it's like La Real are doing this with a depleted uh, squad as well. They have so many injuries right now and they're still top. So if they can get healthy in the spring and keep up the pace, um, they could at least, they can definitely at least get Champions League. Yeah, yeah. And I'll say one difference between last year versus this year. Last year, they had a good run. But I was looking at the fixtures. Like last year, they had a good run, but they hadn't played Barca yet. They hadn't played Madrid yet. They hadn't played, actually, they played Madrid, but they hadn't played Barca. They hadn't played Atletico. They hadn't played Sevilla. They hadn't played... Villarreal and a couple of teams, but they've already played a lot of those teams now. And I think it's only Madrid and um, Villarreal that they haven't played. So I do see them keeping this up maybe till January, but till then I'm not sure because they do have, I think they don't score enough goals. And defensively, mm -hmm. they, they play a sort of like tiki taka catenaccio, which is a, which is a mouthful. And what I mean is that they use the possession to defend. So I'm not sure how they will go how good they are defensively when it's a end-to-end -end game. I don't think they have that personnel. And I, when the season 
gets to that stage, they might be stretched and that might be an issue for them continuing where they are in the table. Yeah, that's true. Uh, one thing too is that, you know, uh, over this week, they couldn't be uh, Sturm grads in the Europa League. And because of that, it's very unlikely, well, at least in my opinion, for them to get um, first place in their group. So they're going to have to go through that extra match week in the, in the spring. Um, yeah, and that puts extra pressure and, and stress on the squad. But once mm -hmm. he knows what that is, is Villarreal, they got a dominant 1-0 win. It was a sort of 1-0 fashion because it's happened every really showed up. But the big story is Unai Emery, like he was linked to Newcastle. He came out and he's like, he said he was staying. Like how big of a PR win is that Newcastle link for him? Well, it shows that, you know, his CV is still very strong. Um, and well, he is like, a, you know, a perennial winner, uh, regardless of if it's, you know, people want to denigrate the Europa League. But um, he's still a coveted manager in Europe. Yeah, yeah, he's a top manager. And he's one of the reasons why it's going like be a real for this group that they are in the Champions League with Manchester United, with Atalanta. I am semi confident they can go through. Um, and do you share that optimism, or am I being overly optimistic with the scene? Vieira is like their league form and their Euro form are so different. Yeah. Um, so it's hard to say if they had if they had been able to close out the the Manchester United game, I would be a lot more optimistic. Yeah. Um, the next game is that's really gonna hurt them in, in the final round. Yeah, because in the final, I think in the last game they play Atalanta away, which will be tough. But Atalanta, they haven't been relatively, they haven't been pulling trees in Serie A like they normally do. So, yeah, we'll have to see about that. <laughs> Let's see about that. But what about, in terms of struggling team, what about Athletic? Uh, they lost to Cadiz. Cadiz had a back to back, they have back to back wins right now in San Mamez. I really don't understand Cadiz and how. Statistically, they shouldn't be like get the points they do, but they somehow do. Athletic, they have no striker. How do they? How do you think they can get over that problem with an attack? Because offensively, they're very blunt. They're a very blunt team. I well, okay. This is my personal opinion. Um, that I do think I do rate uh, Chocolosano. Um, so I think that. You know, if um, Alvaro Severa had more faith in him, um, <clears throat> I, he could be the answer to Cadiz's scoring problems. I mean, he scored a hat trick a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah so maybe. And yeah, with Cadiz, but I feel one thing with Cadiz is they defend so deep that when it sends counterattack, it's like they're making up so, for so many miles, for so many kilometers that the other team just like recuperates this season. Every team knows how they play. So it's it's very difficult. Like I do think they might struggle this year or struggle a lot. Similar to Granada, who lost against Espanol. And how good is Raul de Tomas this season? He's great. I mean, he's always been great. Um, but you know, this season he's really, um, I guess trying to make a case for himself. Yeah. And he, he got called up to the Spanish national team. Do you agree with that? Do you think that's something that he deserves it? I think so. Um, I mean, Luis Enrique, his selections always uh, leave you um, confused sometimes. But I think Heredete has a lot to prove. Yeah. Uh, and we'll see. see what about Especially, you know, um, oh, sorry. I was just going to say that, you know, Spain is do or die for them in this international uh, break. So yeah, because they have that match in Greece where they have to get a result, and I believe are they? I believe they're playing Sweden at, at home, but like Sweden is a very good team with Zlatan with uh, Isak. So that's going to be tough. It's going to be tough for them to qualify for the World Cup through first, and even maybe even through second if Greece gets a win. Oof. 
<laughs> yeah, it's going to be interesting, right? Who says international break is boring? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and with Joselu, do you think he can be in that team anytime soon? He was he scored two goals in Alaves's win against uh, Levante. He's responsible for over close to sixty percent of their goals. Maybe, um, you know, Alaves is like, they usually struggle and you know, him being their savior, kind of, I don't, I don't want to say like it, um, it's great what he's doing, you know, in a team like that. Um, so maybe he will get the call up soon, um, but it's a lot of competition. And again, you never know with Luis Enrique. Sure, yeah, he's he's a funny guy. And on Levante, they've been really struggling this year. No win so far. It's going to be sad to see them go, personally, because I, I love the way they play, but it, it looks like they're going to go, right? I mean, has it been? It's been like 21 games um, without, uh, without a win for Levante. It's, yeah, you know, it's very, last season, Levante was the thorn in Atleti's shoe to the, to the title. Um, you know, as a Betis fan, uh, <laughs> Levante always had Betis number, especially in Kike Setien Reign. So it's, it's kind of odd to see them in this place because they always played such good football. Um, but they got rid of the last managers, so I don't know. Um, I just, okay, so my hope is that Levante and Getafe don't, like, don't make the relegation fight um, <laughs> uninteresting. Oh, because right now they're already, like, five, they're already very deep. Yeah. And if they do go down, like, so many of their players are, like, ripe for, like, taken from other La Liga teams like Enes Bardi, Jorge de Frutas, Campania, Mufre Tafi, there's Jene, there's Niam, and as you now, like so many really good players, like it'll be, it'll be like for me personally, it'll be sad to see them go, but it looks like they look like they're drifting away at this point. Mallorca and Elche, not so much, like they had a 2-2 draw. Um, Elche played really good football. Boye scoring both goals. He's another striker who's like somewhat underrated, to be honest. Like he's he's very good. And he had a great game against Real Madrid uh, the week before. Like, do you race him highly or? Yeah, um, but um, there's a lot of competition. Um, so we'll see, but. What the rest of the season says. Uh, Elche are like a very um, interesting team. I honestly am surprised that they didn't go down last season. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they, they could have, but Huesca, for some reason, couldn't score to save their lives against Valencia. We were playing for nothing. <laughs> yeah, that was, I, I watched that game. That was so uh, frustrating. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, like like moving on to different country to Calcio. Uh, have you have you been following the movements of Giovanni Simeone in the recent weeks? Somewhat. Um, you know, he's um, no, his dad is um, it's a cholo, so it's like he's always going to be on the news. Uh, but you know, it's actually uh, going to. He's actually, uh, I guess, uh, yeah. proving himself this season. Yeah, because he scored four against Lazio, I think two against Inter, and now he scored against Napoli. He like calls in their, or being the second team to hold their incredible run at the top of the table. And it's, it's like, you mentioned Levante with, and I, I believe I made this point before, you mentioned Levante like in La Liga, in Serie A, it's Verona is like a similar team. And it's it's just nice to see how, they're sort of that weird team that like like sticking points of the big boys, which I sort of which I really like. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. they've already done it this season, uh, so we'll see if this uh, is. So I guess uh, in Serie A, it's like Napoli, um, 
Milan, and Milan are top. Yeah, Milan's on top. Uh, they drew with Inter this, which doesn't really help Inter because they're still like a long way off. But Juve, they won this weekend, but they got to the lofty heights of eighth position. <laughs> <laughs> and they're, they're having the season that Barcelona had last season. And I guess they had last season where they're already through in the Champions League. They won four in a row in the Champions League, the first time they've been through after four games. But in Serie A, they're, they're eight and they're like 14 points away from the top, four points away from Atalanta in fourth, which is not doesn't read well for Juve but I don't know like do you think they can in the champion like why 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 do teams in Champions League do so well but in league form do so poorly it, it's so it's so weird yeah let's see Juve's uh Champions League group it was them Chelsea um Seni and Malmo yeah. so it's like Perhaps in a in a harder group, it wouldn't be doing as well. Um, True. True. I mean, Perhaps. it's like a, might be similar to us, how where they lose the top um, the top seed against the other you know top team. Yeah. Um, yeah, but so far, like I don't see them doing that well in Calcio, maybe or in, in Serie A. Like I don't know, like because this year the title race is between so far it's between Napoli and Milan, so. And it'll be nice when both of them play. That'll be a big event. Did you get a chance yeah. to check out the results for the Manchester Derby? It's- yeah. So <laughs> I, I was reading the other day that, you know, if um, if Solskjaer was at Madrid, he would have already been sacked so many times. <laughs> but, you know, he's, he's, he's going to survive this. And, you know, there's no doubt um, in, yeah. I guess, the Glazers um, mind that they're going to stick with him right now. Yeah, it is an improvement, though, from 0 5 to 0 2. <laughs> <laughs> it's an improvement for sure. Uh, and they're still like, I think they're like six points away from or five points away from the top four there. Chelsea dropped points this weekend to like Burnley and which is the Spanish, this English version of Cadiz. <laughs> Liverpool <laughs> lost 3 2. Did you see Jurgen Klopp's rants about corners? Uh, I didn't. Um, I definitely will after this. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's a complainer, right? Because he's like, his team get whenever his team gets beat and he loves to rant to the media. Mm-hmm. Surprisingly, Arsenal, six points off the top, which is weird. Like, he started so badly, and I guess Alteta's at the wheel. <laughs> there it's like he's finally uh, found his groove it's you know yeah. maybe he is the real deal after all and we were like we were all the people that wanted him out um i guess uh, see if they turned their um changed they were proven wrong but we'll see yeah well, uh, this arsenal haven't um they still need i guess need to prove themselves against uh, the other top six teams yeah um, but you know, winning, you know, in football, like winning, winning the the games you're supposed to win, uh, goes a lot, and that's what they've been doing. So, yeah, yeah. And, and to be fair, like for example, when I think when Atletico won the league last year, they didn't beat Real Madrid, and they only got mm-hmm. one from the top two. So, if you're if you're you beat the teams that you should beat, like you don't really need to beat the top teams if you're. To, to win stuff or to get fourth. And uh, yeah, but in Germany, there was a huge game between Leipzig and Dortmund. And you're, you are you live in America, you're American. And I want to ask you about Jesse Marsh. Like he started the season 40, but step by step, he's starting to get good results. I watched this game and they were like highly dominant against Dortmund. It, they should have scored a lot more. And how, like, from an American point of view, how is having a coach like Jesse March coaching in the Bundesliga, how does that reflect on U.S. soccer? Well, he's not the first or even the um, only one. But I think him coming from MLS, because uh, he was, he's, he's a Red Bull, um, I guess, through and through uh, manager. He coached the New York Red Bulls and he went to South uh, Red Bull Salzburg, and now he's at Leipzig. 
Um, so it's like, I guess having them having that faith in him uh, since the MLS days really um, shows that, you know, there's a lot of untapped talent, managerial talent too. Um, and, you know, if Leipzig um, didn't, uh, wasn't, you know, such a, I, okay. What I want to say is like, you know, Leipzig has faith in their system. Yeah. So they weren't going to sack him, at, you know, in the beginning. And uh, now he's getting, he's, he's getting the group. Uh, so we'll see. Um, unfortunately, you know, Bayern already has a very sizable lead. They yeah. look even better than last year. Um, yeah, because they, they beat Freiburg this weekend. And Freiburg, had, they, they ran unbeaten since the start of the season until they played Bayern, which is weird to see them in the, in the top four. But it's, yeah, it was very interesting, that one. But yeah, like you're right, Bayern do have a dominant position right now. Dortmund, they've not been doing that well, though. Like against Ajax, they lost 4 0 in Amsterdam, 3 1 in, um, in the Signa in Duda Park. And they might be in trouble in that group because Sports in Lisbon, they're, or Sports in CP, they're, very, they're a very good team and they could reverse the results in Portugal. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, it's just weird to see what ha what's happening in Dortmund because with the change of coach, he expects them to really push on this season. Even with, with Holland, even despite losing Sancho, but with Holland, like push on, push Bayern a bit closer because the problem was that the problem was that the old coach was not good, but we're still seeing that same issues. You know, I Marco Rosa, I think, is a good coach, um, and Dortmund is has been is going to a somewhat of a injury crisis as well. You know, Han is, is out for the rest of the year. Um, so they really, I mean, like you said, in Champions League, they might be in trouble if um, Sporting can reverse uh, the, the tie. Um, Dortmund is like supposed to be Bayern's rival, but so, something always happens to them. And it's, it's kind of a shame really. Yeah, especially in the games in the Allianz Arena, they usually get like their ass. <laughs> yeah, and uh, speaking of like teams dominate leagues dominated by one team, PSG, they have a healthy lead, ten points in Liga. So I guess the less said about that, the better. But in Portugal, it's very interesting. Benfica won six one, but and the reason I mentioned Benfica is they're one point behind Porto in Sporting, but Barcelona play them next, and given how the result went in Lisbon. Do you think Benfica can do the double against Barcelona, or will Barcelona, with the new manager factor, will that will that be too much for them? I don't. I don't think Benfica can do the double. Um, I do. Uh, you know, it's like clubs always have a new manager bounce, and with a legend like Xavi, it's. I do think Barcelona is going to. Um, be able to bounce back right a little bit. I don't um, even with their injury crisis, and Benfica might play a little bit more conservative. Um, so we'll see. But I, you know, Benfica, if they don't go through, it's going to be because of the game against Dynamo Kiev. Yeah. Um, so by that all, um, I think they'll be able to see it through. Okay. Nice. And finally, like your, you support LAFC in the MLS. Yesterday was the Shinde. How did that go for LAFC? Uh, yeah, that was very bad. So it's like the whole, so yeah, the last game of the season needed a win and they lost five to two. So, oh. so no. very, very disappointing. Yeah. And who are the favorites in the MLS right now? Like where, because Toronto, where I'm based, they used to be very good, but they haven't had a good season. And so, which two, three teams do you think will be fighting for the MLS Cup at the end of this season? MLS is uh, famously hard to predict. Um, so, if you know, if all, if things went down as you always think they will. Uh, New England would win and probably go against Seattle in the in the final. Seattle's a big um, always there. Yeah, 
So um, Seattle has been in like the last four or something finals. Um, so it's like, but they are also um, missing Jao Paulo, who was a very center or uh, piece uh, in their midfield uh, in their attack. So I don't know if they can reach the final. If, uh, but also, I mean, personally, and I guess in terms of like production, having New England in the final and them playing in their football stadium would um, would not be great, to say, to say the least. Um, I think uh, NYCSC could uh, could pose a challenge. They they picked up steam um, these past couple of days. Uh, I mean, these past couple of match weeks. So, in Colorado, the team that LAFC lost, uh, they also seem to really know how to how to manage a game. Right. So it's it's going to be a good good playoff playoff run. Yeah, yeah, nice and. As, you, as we know, this week and next week is international break. So, but the women's Champions League is still going on. And for those who have never watched the women's Champions League game, and maybe they're sort of interested in let's see what's going on in the wild and crazy world of women's football, which games would you recommend for them? Mm. Okay, so this week, um, the the. So it's going to be Lyon versus Bayern. Lyon are like one of the best teams of all time in uh, women's football. So that for sh- and Bayern, uh, they actually are pretty good. Um, so yeah, that's the game to watch. I would say uh, this match day. That's on Wednesday. It's free on YouTube. Uh, the Zone. Um, so really, I guess nothing. Um, it's no reason not to watch. Uh, so, but. Personally, I have been following uh, Real Madrid Femenino. Uh, they're going against uh, PSG tomorrow. And that's also, a, it's going to be a good test for them. Because um, they, they didn't really start the league season well there, right? Yeah. It, I mean, they were in relegation places um, as well. So it's, it's been a tough start for them in the league. Uh, but in Champions League, they, they've been doing pretty well. And, but, you know, it's like, Okay, PSG, they won. Um, they dethroned Lyon, who again was, was the team to beat in all of Europe last year. So it's going to be tough. Um, and sounds, it's also in, in Paris. So, yeah, sounds exciting. So, like, like you said, it's like the football never really stops. And <laughs> it's like a nice have you here to discuss so wide a range of topics. And where can people find you? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, on Twitter at Food Fanatica, I'm popular football lover. Um, yeah, I follow like, I mean, I watch a lot of a lot of football. Um, following a lot of different teams. Um, so yeah, Vietnam. it's sorry. Even Vietnam, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I am going to watch their game uh, this international break. Um, yeah, and it's been a pleasure. Like, I really enjoyed our conversations, and thanks for coming on. And that's all we have for this week. And hope you guys enjoy the international break and enjoy exploring different kinds of football. Adios. Bye. Thank you.